I think it might be useful to clarify a few things right off the bat. By simple definition, we are in the business of winning wars. What else do you need an army for? Take the Cold War. We won, without firing a single shot. Why? Number one, we just flat out outspent them. The Russians couldn't shovel money into the fire as fast as we could. Number two, and this is where my command comes in, technology. Nobody shapes nature the way we do. We take atoms and molecules, and before we're finished with them, they're everything from combat boots to bombs, the kind of bombs that nobody from the other side will ever see until the damn thing's plowing down their chimney like Santa Claus from hell. General. Uh, what? This is not the first time you've been here. We've been down this road before, that is correct. Several times, in fact. I haven't been keeping count. Well, let me refresh your memory. You have before you a document? I do. <clears throat> the sensor-fused anti-tank missile. Well, I'll be the first to admit that this program did have its share of difficulties. We did experience a glitch or two with the thing, and that much is certain. But even a heat-seeking missile can miss a target. General, I see here that you taped electric hot plates to the surface of the vehicle to help your heat-seeking missile find its target, and that the temperature of the vehicle was so high that it could have fried an egg at 20 feet. Vince, fire. There was a verifiable deviation from the standard test data accumulation. There were other deviations, were there not? What about the paveway bomb? I'm not going to sit here and tell you the paveway never missed. It missed by a mean distance of five miles and nearly 50% of the time. You know, in baseball, a guy who hits 400 is considered pretty damn great. In baseball, the losing team isn't killed by their opponents. Be that as it may, the paveway is one hell of a bomb. Laser-guided, state-of-the-art, and it proved what? That we have an effective weapon as long as the enemy allows us to build a two-story crane directly above their tanks? We have had some spectacular successes. Such as? That's classified information. General. Please, uh, let's move on to the next item on our list. The Bradley fighting vehicle. What would you say the batting average is for the Bradley, General? It takes people with sophisticated knowledge and expertise to conduct these tests and to interpret the results. If the U.S. Army acted on the advice of every Tom, Dick, and Harry who had an opinion on these matters, we'd wind up with a bunch of B-52s powered by outboard motors. I fail to see your point. My point is that a lot of things have to come together to create a new weapon, and it takes teamwork. Good old-fashioned teamwork. Colonel James Burton, was he part of your team, General? More or less. Close, sir. Sergeant, can you tell me how to get to 4E624? Forward and to the escalator, your left. Two flights up to four, your left. E ring, your right. Proceed past corridor nine, face left. Thank you.
no secret that Colonel Burton had a rocky tenure, that we didn't see eye to eye. But it didn't start out that way. No, 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 no. I spoke to General Hall. General Hall spoke to General Jones. General Jones spoke to Admiral Watts. Well, then write it down. That takes care of Spina in Rhode Island and Mays from Nebraska. Any Democrats? No, forget him. Because he's a scum sucking Judas who'd sell his own mother for a handful of votes. <laughs> How about the Senate? That son of a bitch. After we papered his state with contracts. All right, then, let's just make the fuselage of Michigan and the landing gear in Mississippi. Oh, <laughs> by all means, let's keep Congressman Groves and his blood sucking buddies happy. Welcome, Colonel. Thank you, General. Thought you and I ought to get to know one another. I welcome the opportunity, sir. Fact is, I'd like to help you. Thank you, sir. I don't mean to alarm you, Colonel, but this new job of yours under certain circumstances could turn into a real shit burning detail. You're gonna need as many friends as you can get. I'd like you to count me as one of them. Well, I appreciate that, sir. Air Force Academy. Strategic Air Command. MBA from Auburn. Your commanding officer, General DeGrasso, and I are old friends. He says, as far as you're concerned, the sky is the limit. <laughs> but then you draw the short straw. I was assigned, sir. Ah, oh, hell, it's a bum deal, whoever made it. Every other year, somebody decides we're spending too much money. So a bunch of pencil necks put their pointy little heads together and come up with a plan. This year, it's the Joint Live Fire Test Program, staffed with officers from every branch of the service. So now we got the Army, Navy, Air Force, and Marines doing a circle jerk over weapons testing, and you get to hold the big dick. <laughs> I mean, who thinks up this nonsense? Congress, sir? And so it should. That's its job. You'll never hear me criticize the Hill. Although you'd think Congress has enough of their own shit to shovel without wondering what's going on over here. Well, I'm not anticipating any problems with the posting, sir. Neither am I. Man doesn't come as far in his career as you have without knowing how to walk a minefield. Howard Matheson came here two rotations ago. That Marlin is not the only thing he caught. I got him into CINCOM when he left here. Now he's the head of their missile testing. Blake Gilmore, you know Blake? No, sir. Man wasn't even a full bird colonel when he left here for the private sector. That was four years ago. Fuel frequency gain, modulator contracts later, and look at him. Man could buy and sell both of us a thousand times over. Lucky man. Smart man. First rate soldier, just like you, Colonel. Knew how to make the best of a difficult situation. Now, this new job of yours is too tough for any one man to go it alone. It's going to require teamwork. Here you go. These are a couple of your projects undergoing testing the UH 60 helicopter. The AV-8B jump jet and the Bradley fighting vehicle. All outstanding programs, all organized and ready to go. I did a little homework for you, give you a leg up. Well, I appreciate that, General. You know, you could return the favor by giving the Bradley there just a little extra attention. Attention? We need it in the field. The sooner the better. Just make sure it goes on top of all the things in your inbox so that it'll get into your outbox as soon as possible. As a personal favor to me. Best of luck to you, Colonel. Thank you, sir. Colonel. Sir? Next time you're told to report to this office, be on time. Yes, sir. Sir? Colonel James Burton? I'm here to take a look at the Bradley fighting vehicle test. Straight ahead, sir. Thank you. There he is. That's the guy? That's him. He's supposed to be real smart. Squadron officer, school, air command, and staff college. First tour at the Pentagon? He was at the Air Force lab in Albuquerque when Congress called. He's a soldier, not just a manager. What do you mean? He's put in his fair share of flying time. It's like a fucking choir boy to me. Maybe, but nothing gets ordered into production until he signs off. Attention. Target is now in position. Robert. 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 J.D. Bach. 
Welcome to the team. <laughs> Colonel Bach. Yes, sir. Good to see you. This is Major Sayers, our chief tester, Army Weapons Research Lab. Major. So I have an Air Force guy end up overseeing tests run by the Army. Well, could have been worse. How's that? Congress could have appointed someone from the Navy. <laughs> <laughs> The range is now hot. The range is now hot. Commencing the armor penetration tests on the Bradley fighting vehicle. Attention on the firing line. Attention on the firing line. You ready on the right? Ready on the left. Firing line is ready. Firing detail. Commence firing. Impressive armor. Congratulations. All right. Great show with me, gentlemen. Join us, Colonel Burton. <laughs> Congratulations. Thanks for your help on that one. You know we couldn't have done it without you. Thanks for your help on that one, son. Thank you, General. Say, say Colonel, are, are you going to join us? Well, uh, shouldn't we take a closer look? No, no, actually, it's safety precautions. See, the fire team goes out there first, and then no one else is allowed near the vehicle for at least another hour. Well, why is that? With any anti-armor test involving a live round, there's always a freak chance that something might blow after the fact. Plus, we don't want to lose your first day on the job, Colonel. So how about that drink? Sounds good, Major. There'll be a phone call for you in your office at exactly 1100 hours. It's important you be there. I took the liberty of unpacking a few of your things. Thank you, Sergeant. Family, sir? What's that? Family. Oh, <laughs> that's my uncle. He was a flyer in World War II. Hmm. What's that? This is the plane I learned to fly in. T-28. Used to take her up, slide the canopy back, fly for hours. Just me in the sky. Personally, sir, I like the sky right where it is, with me on the ground looking up at it. So, where are you from, sir? Just outside of Chicago. Hmm. And where would that be? Normal. Normal, Illinois? Is that on a map? Uh, yes, Sergeant, it is. Is it normal or normal? I think the word is uneventful. You getting paid by the hour, Colonel? <laughs> no, no, I uh, got an appointment. I'll um, take this, Sergeant, thank you. Fine. Colonel Burton. Hello? The test on the Bradley, I hear you wanted to take a closer look. How did you hear that? When it comes to the Bradley, follow your instincts, Colonel. Who is this? I can't tell you that right now. Well, whoever you are, I don't take unsolicited advice from people I don't know. Just make sure you read the fine print, Colonel. Early, sir. Oh, I thought I'd drop by on my way to the office, Sergeant. Check out the Bradley. Sir, isn't your office 40 miles that way, sir? 
Yes, Sergeant. Yes, it is. Has anything been altered on this vehicle since the test? No, sir. Are you looking for something, sir? Just reading the fine print, Sergeant. Just reading the fine print. Stinger missiles, 50 cal tracers, 7.62 tracers, 25 millimeter rounds. What's this? That's what was used on the Bradley, sir. This writing, it's Romanian, isn't it? Yes, sir, it is. Sir. Colonel Bach and Major Sears won't be here until noon. That's when our first test of the day is scheduled, sir. Well, this isn't exactly an all-out test, Sergeant. More like a little pop quiz. Sir. I'm not sure regulations will allow us to borrow the door from the ammunition ship for a pop quiz, sir. Uh -huh. Sir, regulations state that the ammunition shed should never be left open, sir. Duly noted, Sergeant. I believe that regulation will also apply to removing the door entirely, Colonel. Also duly noted. Fire when ready. Back blast area clear. On the way, sir. Fire. You wrecked a door? Colonel, the ammunition that was used in the last test on the Bradley is the same as we used on this door. Romanian, arguably the most ineffective ammunition in the world. No wonder the Bradley came through with flying colors. Well, this is very serious. It is. Yes, you've destroyed a door. Colonel, we're talking about a test on an armored personnel carrier? Right. A vehicle that will carry soldiers into combat? Right, but this door is property of the United States government. I assume you knew that. The shell barely penetrated the door. OK, but now it's all bent out of shape. How are you going to get it back on its hinges? Well, right now, I'm not really worried about putting it back on yes, its hinges. Yes, but this door protects our ammunition. The ammunition doesn't work. But we need the ammunition for our test. Look, I'll buy the Army a new goddamn door. You can't afford a door like that. Did you see what it stood up to? Exactly! Some, some spitball from Romania! It was my understanding that only Soviet arms would be used in these tests. Well, yes. And Romania is one of the Soviet blocs. Isn't it? Colonel Burton, uh, we've been testing the Bradley for some time now. You may not be aware of some of the steps we've taken. The Romanian rocket is only 73 millimeters. That's less than the 85 millimeter Russian version. A smaller diameter means a smaller explosion, and a smaller hole, and less shrapnel. We we're interested in conducting ballistic tests using all sorts of ammunition of varying diameters to determine the exact threshold of the Bradley's tolerance. So far, it's held up against everything we've thrown at it, sir. Soviet, Romanian, Latvian, Lithuanian. Like a rock. My apologies. Well, you're new to the project. There's a lot to catch up on. You're right. So if you'll just get me the test reports, I can catch right up. How's that, Colonel? Send me the data. I'll do my homework, and we can push this thing right through. But we've got five years of test reports on this model alone, sir. We have a schedule to maintain. And let's keep to it. Get the Bradley into production ASAP. What do you say? Thank you, gentlemen. I've seen Com recruiting me. This could blow the whole deal. I'm telling you, sir, you've got to nip this in the bud like you did with the last guy. Don't worry about it. Sir, he wants to see the reports. How are we going to stop him? Just give him the reports. Are you out of your mind? I'm not going to show him a single page. Now listen to me. Listen very carefully. Give him everything he wants. Every single piece of paper. 
Everything. is all this? Everything you ever wanted to know about the Bradley and weren't afraid to ask. Every memo on every last nut and bolt. Wonder which national forest laid down its life for this project. You read any of this stuff? Not yet, sir. I was hoping you'd show up with the cliff notes. <laughs> I hardly know where to start. Maybe that's the whole idea. I don't get it. What? That. It's a Bradley. Well, if that's the Bradley, then what's this? What's the date? <laughs> 1968. The question is, how did they get to that? From this. Gentlemen, our mission was to design and implement an infantry transport vehicle that would be a worthy replacement for the M113 armored personnel carrier. We have met that objective and then some. The Bradley armored personnel carrier will bring troops to a combat zone swiftly, efficiently, and safely. It will hold 11 men plus a driver and features a 20 millimeter cannon, which will provide ample firepower and at the same time flexibility. Lightly armored, speedy, and solidly engineered, our troops will be arriving at the battlefield in the very finest American technology has to offer. And at a million and a half per, a real bargain. Nice work, Colonel. Outstanding. Damn impressive. In other words, it was designed to be a big taxi cab, drive guys to the battlefield and go back home. <laughs> but how? Did it end up with a turret on top? Mm. Mm -hmm. Well, this is all well and good, Colonel Smith, but something wrong, General? Well, with this gorilla in production, I don't suppose there's going to be anything left in the budget for my scout. Doubt it, Bob. You don't need scouts. You have radar, air recon, satellites. You always need a scout. And you know what I'm thinking? Why couldn't this thing serve as a scout? But it's a, it's a troop carrier, General. But this is a speedy vehicle. Why can't it be both? Well, for one thing, it's too big. And for the other, you can't really see out all that much from inside. Sounds like a design flaw to me. Design flaw? Uh, no. No, we, we'll just stick a turret on top with lots of opticals. But then, sir, it, it'll be even bigger. Well, what's your problem, Smith? Not elegant enough for you? <laughs> <laughs> Well, uh, the thing is, General, it's kind of hard to do a sneak and peek when you're over 10 feet tall. He's got a point, Bob. Well, all I know is we need a scout. This is fast enough to do the job, and it's funded. Well, um, actually, we're a hair over budget. You turn the Bradley into a scout. We're going to be selling them off to some El Presidente de Chimichunga in no time. Anything for surveillance ends up south of the border before the paint even dries. When you needed that anti-aircraft gun, who backed you up on that? You did, Bob. And who testified to appropriations on behalf of that gun? You did, Bob. I'm talking to appropriations next week. Now, do I sell you on my scout or do I not? You did, Bob. And how about some portholes along the side for individual firearms so the fellows can stick out their guns and shoot people? Good. And you know what, Colonel? We already have the turret. We ought to get the biggest bang we can up there. I'm sorry, bang, sir? You can't hurt anybody with that pansy-ass gun. Add on some firepower. Where am I supposed to fit the extra ammo? I don't know. Can't you just shift things around? Make some room. You already got 4,400 rounds of machine gun ammo. Now you want to add 25 millimeter shells. General wants his ammo. He can't have his ammo, unless he runs alongside this thing carrying it. Well, can't you just squeeze it in? No. Oh, come on, just squeeze it in. We're not trying on Levi's here, Colonel. Are you telling me that in a vehicle this size, you can't find room for a few rounds of ammunition? Not in its current configuration, no, sir. So the configuration's wrong. There must be something you can dump. Dump, sir? Something you don't need. General, the interior is very spare. Besides the ammunition and, and the men... Maybe you can leave one of the fellows behind. Put the ammo where the men go. Sir. 
It is a troop carrier. So? Make a couple extra trips. What's the difference? They want a transport that doesn't carry men and a scout that's got a cannon as big as a tank's on it. And portholes. Oh, great, portholes. So the guys can shoot at whatever they can't hit with their cannon. You don't have to buy the damn thing, Jones. Just draw it. That's a problem. Why? You go out in a battlefield with this pecker sticking out of your turret, and the enemy's gonna unload on you with all they got. Might as well paint a big red bullseye on the side. But it's a troop carrier, not a tank. Do you want me to put a sign on it in 50 languages? I'm a troop carrier, not a tank. Please don't shoot at me. This was gonna be so beautiful. That's good work, Smith. Looks perfect to me. Thank you, sir. Thing is... Yes, General? Looks a little like a tank with that cannon on top. Uh, probably gonna draw more fire. Actually, sir, that has come to our attention. We know it's not a tank, but will the other side? I guess we could always thicken the armor, toughen up the hide a bit. Colonel Smith, could you explain why you put those portals there? Uh, yes, sir. As per your request, sir, the men could shoot out um, at the enemy. You're joking, aren't you? Besides portholes, what are we in now, the Navy? <laughs> <laughs> Say, you think you could make this thing amphibious? You know, get the troops across a river? No. Uh, no, sir. No. No, 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 no. Amphibious? The Bradley's supposed to swim? In theory, at least. Amphibious troop carrier slash scout slash tank. Couple more months, I bet they can get this thing to fly. What's this in the margin? Please help me. I am losing my mind. RLS. Lieutenant Colonel Robert Laurel Smith, Head of Oversight and Development. Aluminum. This thing's got an aluminum skin. Huh? Anything an enemy tank fires at is gonna go through it like a hot knife through butter. We're doing the specs on using steel rather than aluminum. Of course, steel is much heavier than aluminum, so it won't go as fast. No, we can't lose speed. We lose speed, it won't work as a scout vehicle. It won't keep pace with the M1 tanks either. Thicker armor's a reactive measure. Let's think proactive here. I say equip the thing with anti-tank missiles. Then it can blast those enemy tanks before they get a chance to fire. What do you think, Colonel? Fine. Anti-tank missiles? I don't know. Where do I put them? The men will have to wear the missiles as hats. I don't know, Jones. That's why you get paid the big bucks. Colonel, there's no room. We're not talking about... About a pair of Levi's. I know, I know! God damn it! What we are talking about is 11 years with nothing to show for it. Except that also the size of the District of Columbia and a career that's on permanent hold. You see this? I've been a, I've been a bird colonel so long, I swear I'm growing feathers. Now, if you have to design hats to hold those goddamn missiles, then just do it. Gentlemen, if I can have your attention, please. If you'd all just take your seats. Thank you. We are pleased to present a scale model of the new Bradley fighting vehicle.
and anti-tank capabilities. It carries six men. How many was it supposed to carry? Eleven. Bradley is outfitted with the most sophisticated surveillance equipment ever developed. It is also equipped with a rapid-fire cannon and an anti-tank rocket launcher. Which means it's loaded with 1,500 shells and 10 tow anti-tank missiles. So in summation, gentlemen, what you have before you is a troop transport that can't carry troops, a reconnaissance vehicle that's too conspicuous to do reconnaissance, and a quasi-tank that has less armor than a snowblower, but has enough ammo to take out half of DC. Fantastic. Congratulations, General Smith. General? Hell of a job. General. Let's build it. They're building it? This is what we're building? This will be brief as I'm needed at the Oval Office. I want to call your attention to this morning's New York Times. If you'd be so kind to turn to the editorial page. It essentially says that every weapon we produce is an overpriced piece of junk. Now, that's not news. Critics have said it for years. What was news to me touched on our supposedly spectacular Sergeant York anti-aircraft gun. It says there that when the Sergeant York proved incapable of hitting airplanes, we test fired it at hovering helicopters. When it failed to hit hovering helicopters, we fired it at stationary targets and it missed those. Now, is this possible, General Keene? There was a problem with the proximity fusing. According to this, one missile locked onto a ventilation fan in a latrine and destroyed the latrine. Were we test firing at latrines that day? My first sergeant was in that latrine at the time, and I can assure you he's around to swear otherwise. Why am I learning about these things in the newspaper? It makes me look foolish, and I am not a foolish man. General Cushing, are you having any problems with the Maverick missile you're testing? No, sir. Admiral Morehouse, any problems with the A-12? None whatsoever, sir. General Partridge? Sir. Any problems with the Bradley? No, sir. Absolutely not. Production is imminent. Mr. Secretary, I believe the press is on a wild goose chase, looking for problems where none exist. Let's hope you're right, General, because there are people in this administration who do have problems. Terrorists in Lebanon, and Colonel Gaddafi in Libya, and Sandinistas in Nicaragua. And let's not forget our ongoing problems with the Soviet Union. Frankly, I don't appreciate calls from reporters and congressmen asking me why nothing we are working on works. And I can't answer them because the men in charge of developing these systems tell me everything is just peachy. So, if you don't have problems, good. If you do, get rid of them. I want these weapons built. If not by you, I'll find men who can. to see me, sir? Yes, I do. Close the damn door. Come on. About these tests you've been thinking about conducting on the Bradley. Now, I understand your concern, but if you knew the vehicle as I do, if you were an armored warfare expert instead of a flyer, you wouldn't be concerned. You'd understand that the Bradley is a good vehicle. 4,000 Americans will be employed building it. The Army wants it. Once you've had a chance to read the files... You... I've read the files, sir. 200 pages on the rear door. 250 pages on the paint job. Computer simulations of combat conditions, not a single test that actually indicates what might happen if the Bradley takes a hit. Which is why I've ordered a full-up live fire test. I want to equip a Bradley with all the ammunition it will take into battle, fill all the fuel tanks, and hit it with the Soviet anti-tank weapons, see how it'll hold up. Cancel it. 
sir. I think we're having a communication meltdown here, Colonel. Whatever problems there are, we'll fix them. In the field. After they're deployed. But, General... That's the way things are done around here, Colonel. That's the way we're gonna do this. Nobody takes your job more seriously than I do, but I also have a job. Gotta get that Bradley deployed. I want that rocket launcher pointed at the Soviets. There. Jesus. There's mess. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, sir. Here. Afternoon. Fanning? Yes, sir. What happened to you? Don't ask. What's this? It was on your desk when I got back from lunch. Some ammunition for your Bradley battle. British Army test report. Top secret, too. Till it landed here. General Smith, Jim Burton. How did you find me? You have very uh, distinctive handwriting. I've been reading memos on the Bradley going back to 1968. With your handwritten notes in the margin or initialed by you. This handwriting? We should not be seen talking. You contacted me, General. No. You received an anonymous leak about which I know nothing. So the British found out that aluminum armor burns and gives off a toxic gas when hit by a shell. Bad news for men in aluminum armored vehicles. Enough said. Couldn't we... Couldn't we sit down somewhere and actually talk? Are you out of your mind, Colonel? If the Pentagon had their choice of busting us or nailing a Soviet spy, they would choose us in a heartbeat. Well, who exactly is us, General? There are some people who work in the Pentagon who are fed up watching billions of dollars thrown away on defective weapons upon which our troops are supposed to stake their lives. People like you, Colonel, we are the enemy. To whom? To majors who want to be colonels, to colonels who want to be generals, to generals who want that four-star. You bet we are the enemy. Nobody moves up without getting things done. So what you don't want to be is the one who drops the ball, because if you're the one who drops the ball, no promotion, no star, no cushy job with a contractor when you retire. Which is why, Colonel, any and everyone attached to the Bradley will see to it to stop your tests. General, I appreciate your interests, if not your methods. Whatever disagreements I may or may not be having over the Bradley will be resolved above board. Now, if you have something to say, I'm sure the Washington Post would love to talk to you. Me? The press? Are you crazy? The Army is my life. Like you, Colonel, I work inside the system, and you don't have a prayer in hell to run in your tests. Not unless you're willing to sacrifice your career. And if you think you're safe because Congress gave you your job, you better think again. Good day, Colonel. And good luck. So why did you send me that report? Sir. Nice to see you, General. Good to see you. <laughs> Can you, sir? Mm -hmm. Can you, sir? Can I move? So she leaned over to me and whispered, why do you think the general always stands at attention? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Jim.
to disturb you, sir, but Major Sayers is in the library. Tell Major Sayers I'm busy. I'm sorry, sir, but he said to tell you that the little prick ordered tests on Bradley. What? I'll have his ass in a sling so fast. Who's that, sir? Major Sayers or the little prick? Wait, uh, General, sir, he now seems to know about the study that the Brits did. What study? The Brits did a study on aluminum. That would be the same aluminum she then used on the Bradley, sir. When hit by a shell, it has a tendency to burn, and when it burns, it gives off a toxic gas. God damn it. We fought a revolution so we wouldn't have to pay any attention to the fucking British. So why are they messing things up now? I thought you talked to him. I did. The man must be an idiot or a fool. Well, can't you stop him, sir? No, I'm not his commanding officer. Some draft-dodging junior congressman decided we needed more objectivity in the testing process. Goddamn checks and balances. Right, uh, General, with all due respect, this isn't just a check, sir. It's more of a full fucking body block. If we don't get the Bradley out there now, It'll be stuck in development forever. Start production now. I'll throw Burton a bone or two. Let him run a couple of tests. Yes, sir. General, actually, he'd like to blow it up. I don't give a flying fuck what Burton wants. Let him do some piddly shit stuff. Take it for a test drive. See if he can parallel park the fucker. Just get it into production. <laughs> Am I to understand that you were not in favor of the tests Colonel Burton proposed? Absolutely not. Absolutely not yes or absolutely not no? Absolutely not absolutely. Are you questioning his motives or his methods, General? I have no reason to question Colonel Burton's motives. I can only speak to his methods, which by anyone's definition were somewhat peculiar. I mean, there were other ways to find out if clothing would catch fire inside the Bradley when it took a hit. Let's take the... the mannequin thing. for you, sir. They said it's important. Very good. Dalton. Yes, sir. I'll meet you back at the firing area. Yes, sir. Strip the dummies. Sir? Strip the dummies, Sergeant. Now. Go. Fire when ready. Back blast area clear. On the way, sir. Fire. <laughs> Hold it there. Let me see those. Uh huh. Oh, that looks good. Uniform is looking great. No damage. Wait, what? What's that? That's part of our test. That's part of our test. Wait a minute. Certainly no one in my command gave the order to strip the dummies and put their clothes inside a fireproof container inside the vehicle while Colonel Burton wasn't around. The insults that were traded that day definitely had no business showing up in the test reports. They were, of course, deleted from the final report. All except Colonel Bach's unfortunate reference to Colonel Burton's mother. I understand temperatures were running high. Apparently inside the Bradley as well. There's a degree of uncertainty involved in every test. That's the point of doing tests, to find out what happens. <laughs> If we knew what the results would be, we wouldn't need to do the test. <laughs> and just because the tests didn't always come out the way Colonel Burton expected, there's no reason to assume that anything devious was going on. I ask you, General, filling the fuel tanks with water 
for a test designed to check the combustibility of those tanks. That wasn't devious. If the tanks had been filled with fuel, there's a good chance the vehicle would have exploded. Isn't that the point? If the vehicle had exploded, we couldn't run additional tests. I can't order up an unlimited number of Bradleys just to blow them up. Of course, you're telling me to spend more money, which I can't imagine you are. General, I believe that efforts were made to make the Bradley amphibious. Yes, although how that's relevant, I failed to comprehend. How many Bradleys were lost during that experiment? Lost. The report says four of the Bradleys sank during testing. Well, that is a matter of opinion. It's not opinion, General. Four of them sank. Technically, yes. General, can we get back to the fuel tanks? Come on. Yeah. Yeah. Sergeant! Yeah. Have the tanks always been filled with water? No, sir. Only when the vehicle's being tested, sir. Whoa. Whoa. What else don't I know? Sergeant, I'm asking you a question. What else don't I know about these tests? The ammunition stored in the Bradley, sir. What about it? Sand. That's affirmative, sir. Tell me. Did the term court-martial ever enter anyone's mind here? No, sir. Really? That's truly amazing, Sergeant. I mean, here we are watching water drip out of the gas tanks and sand spill out of the ammunition right after a test that was done to figure out whether or not the damn thing is safe. And no one here even thinks of the term court-martial. Now, why, if you don't mind my asking, is that we were under orders sir do you think acting on those orders is conscionable sergeant it doesn't matter what i think or do sir because you desk warriors from washington will show up and find a million different ways to make the test turn out whatever way you want sir i'm not here to manipulate test results i'm here to learn the truth you want the truth sir we get a new white knight every other year, sir. Some guy just like you, and you all start off the same. Big speeches that turn to shit after six months when your next promotion comes due. And then it's business as usual. And where did you pick up this lousy attitude, Sergeant? Right here, sir. Watching guys like you. I'm sorry. I'm really sorry to hear that. Because unlike you, I take my job seriously. Really? Well, maybe. Maybe you can explain to me, Colonel, why a Bradley has been ordered into production before you have done your job. Mind telling me what this is? A hundred Bradleys have been ordered? We have a schedule, Colonel Burton, and I'm not gonna have it on my record that the Bradley fell behind schedule just because you're fussing over some goddamn test. Those goddamn tests could save lives. The Bradley will save lives, Colonel, by bringing men to the front line where they're needed. Do you have any idea, Colonel, what would happen to those men if the Bradley takes a hit and the aluminum burns? I know all about the British study, Colonel, and it is bullshit. That thing could be a death trap. Says who? Says me. And how do you know? Have you put people in there during a test? No, of course. So you don't know, Colonel, actually know anything. And until you do, all you're doing is wasting our time. 
Are you suggesting Colonel Burton had no reason to be concerned? I am suggesting that Colonel Burton and his tests did not reveal anything we didn't already know. Except his own penchant for theatrics. Theatrics, General? Yes, theatrics. Cheap theatrics at that. So, Billy, now the little prick has issued a memo that stipulates that for the tests, he'd like to use sheep. Jesus. We've already started work on the chassis, son. Dave, don't worry about it. Well, because if the sheep come out of this thing tits up, we're going to have to stop production. There are ways around it, ways around anything. Absolutely. Like what? Well, we could sick the animal rights people on them. Well, it is cruel and unusual treatment of sheep. Rack of lamb. Yeah, that would be me. Yes? Major say he's just called, sir. Uh-huh. When do they plan to run the test? Immediately, just as soon as we send over the sheep. We? I thought they were in charge of the sheep. They say it's being handled at our end. The Surgeon General's office. What does the Surgeon General have to do with sheep? Ah, oh, excuse me. You must be Colonel Burton. We were told you might show up. Uh, who told you that? Colonel Buck. He established this office last week with the Surgeon General. You're the one who's trying to kill the Bradley. Well, who told you that? I'm sorry, sir. All information in this office is classified. So, what is ruminant procurement, anyway? That's what this office has been created to do. Yeah, but what is it? The analysis and policy determination for the parameters about which will be tendered research data on the optimal test ruminant. Such ruminants are to be cheap. You're talking about sheep. You're in charge of buying the sheep, correct? We can't just go out and buy sheep, sir. Well, why not? We're doing a vaporifics test on sheep. I mean, vaporifics is all about what happens when a warhead penetrates armor. The metal particles vaporize and form a large fireball that fills the troop Lieutenant, compartment. I know what a vaporifics test is. I'm the one who called for it. Well, then you know we have to have sheep specs before we can proceed. Sheep specs? What are sheep specs? Specifications. Shorn or unshorn. Um, rams, ewes, or lambs. Merinos or short hair. I mean, shorn merino ewes or unshorn merino rams. Big horns or domestic? Domestic shorn lambs or big horn unshorn? Just how long will it take you to get your sheep specs? Not long at all. Six, eight months tops. Ah. And then we can go to tender on the research data. But then we'll require another eight months to evaluate the data, after which we can move into the prototype ruminant evaluation. How much? Well... All right, bring it back. Keep it coming. Keep it coming. Keep it coming. Keep it coming. A little more. A little more. Oh! Sir, Colonel Bach is on his way over here, sir. I'm sure he is. For your information, sir, it sounded like a world-class shit fit, sir. I'm sure it is, Sergeant. Moving out. What the hell are these sheep doing here? I bought them. Well, you can't do that. Well, I did. There are no sheep specs, Colonel. I already devised the sheep specs, Major. What are they? They're alive and kicking. And that's good enough for me. Testing is a science, Colonel. Every test has to be a controlled experiment. Just sticking a herd of sheep into a, a vehicle does. You don't want sheep? Leonard! Chavez, get the sheep out of there and get in the Bradley. Dalton! Yes, sir. sir. Get in the Bradley. Sir? I need a vaporifics test. Get in the Bradley. Everyone in the Bradley. Are you totally out of your fucking mind, Colonel? You think this is some kind of joke, Colonel? Well, let's see. Oh, we'll just use the sheep. I think that's a terrific idea. We use the sheep in the Bradley. All sheep in the Bradley. We're gonna use... Ow! Oh, God damn it! Cluster and clear! On the way, sir. Fire! God. Granger, don't breathe! How are you doing? 
I'm okay. Jesus. Just one tiny whiff. Did you get a look inside? Nothing could have survived those fumes. Sergeant! Where are the sheep? Major Sarah said they had to go in the incinerator. What? They just got them away, sir. Oh, no! Oh, stop, stop, stop! Follow oh. those sheep! Sir? Stop that truck! That's in order! Yes, sir. Sergeant? I need them! For autopsy! To verify test results! I see him. We got him, sir. One of the tests I've ordered has been conducted according to plan. And since my job Your is job to... is to stop whining and serve the United States as befits an officer. My job, General, is to oversee the Joint Live Fire Test Program and deliver a report on my findings to Congress. And in order to do that, I'm going to have to insist on a live fire test of the Bradley under combat conditions. There's simply no other way. you fucking fly, boy. You don't know jack shit about combat. I know there are a lot of ways for a soldier to die in that vehicle, sir. Don't you preach to me, you son of a bitch! I want a realistic The test. number one priority is to get those people first! Vehicles second! Those are my priorities. Unfortunately, the Army's priorities seem to be the exact opposite. You are way out of line here. I won't sign up on the Bradley without a live fire test. Sir? Who's Burton's commanding officer? General DeGrasso, sir. Get him for me now. It's an economic move, Colonel. Department-wide, you're being reassigned. In the meantime, should I... Should I continue in my present assignment? Your present assignment has been eliminated, Colonel. I didn't think my job could be eliminated. I was appointed by Congress. But you're paid by the Army. If they can't afford you, and they can't, you have no job. Colonel, it's time to move on. Let's not let this little blip on the screen ground you permanently. ever consider having a drink with an enlisted soldier? Does the enlisted soldier think the colonel needs one? What are they going to do? Fire you? OK, just a little one. What's really ironic? General Omar Bradley was a brilliant tactician and a great leader. No ego, just did the job. And he looked out for the morale and the safety of his men. And then they go and put his name on this thing. 
Talk about a kick in the ass. The closest the brass ever get to a battlefield is the first tee on a Saturday morning. You know, Fanning, I've been around long enough to know that the Pentagon's not a charity. It's, it's cash flows and egos. It's part of it. It's what helps drive it, fine, but somehow, somehow I always thought the men came first. I always thought that the people on top knew that it was about the soldier in the field. You gave it your best shot. Did I? Yes, sir, you did. Well, now it's somebody else's problem. My problem is salvaging my career, which apparently is not beyond repair. I'm a good little boy. So, that's it. That's it. The man said, war is hell. Should have tried peacetime. You don't mind, do you? No, be my guest. I don't believe in government waste. Burton. So they're moving you out. Is there anything you don't hear about? <clears throat> well, how far are you willing to go with this thing? Question is, how far are they going to send me? I think you ought to take a trip to California this weekend. I'm not really up for a vacation right now. No one goes to Fresno for a vacation, Colonel. prefer to meet at the officers club so when did the israelis test it they didn't have to test it they knew by looking at it that it was a death trap so while we're sending our guys off to die the pentagon brass is redesigning the damn thing for somebody else they can't sell it overseas like it is business as usual So maybe you'd like to keep fighting the bastards? 
I've lost my job, General. They're moving me out. So? They're moving you out. You haven't been discharged. Work from inside, from wherever it is they send you. And turn into you? Passing anonymous notes and meeting in parking lots? You know, you're great at sitting in the shadows and telling people what to do. Why don't you get off your ass and do something? I can't. Help me. I have done everything that I can. I've been fighting this battle for almost 20 years. I'm not gonna go to the man over this. I, I, I've got too much to lose. <sighs> 70,000 troops. 70,000 American boys will ride into battle in the Bradley if America fights another war. We can't be a part of sending them to their deaths. One call. What? One call. I'll make one call and that's it. Down. General Partridge, you've read today's Washington Post? I have, Mr. Secretary. And I take it you've seen the story attributed to an anonymous, highly placed Pentagon source? Yes, I have, sir. And may I say I am as deeply distressed as you that anyone in the Pentagon would stoop so low. Leaks within the Pentagon, General, are how I get most of my information. Mr. Secretary, are you suggesting that the Pentagon is less than forthcoming? Less than forthcoming, General? Then perhaps you can explain to me why I have to learn from the press that the man in charge of testing the Bradley fighting vehicle has been fired. He wasn't fired, sir. He was reassigned. By whom? By General DeGrasso, his commanding officer. I'm as shocked as you are. My guess is that there was some confusion between the Army and the Air Force commands. That's the sort of trouble you always get with these cross-departmental joint testing programs. <laughs> Yes? Congressman Stratton is on the phone. Sam, what can I do for you? What article? Oh, that article. No, completely untrue. Inter-office snafu. File it under creative journalism. I'm looking into it now. You'll be the first to know. Right. Right. My best, Alan. General. I want a full update on the Bradley, and I want it in writing. Right away, sir. That is the last call I expect to receive on this matter from Congressman Stratton or anyone else on the Hill. Do I make myself clear, General? Perfectly. Colonel Burton, I want you to write your report on the Bradley. Sir, I was under the impression that my job had been... Your job has been reinstated. I want you to report on my desk by 1,800 hours tomorrow. Yes, sir. And, Colonel, in case you are unaware, as per the military manual, you will deliver your report to me and to me alone. Should so much as a single copy of your report be made public, I will bring you up on charges of willful subversion of military procedure and have you court-martialed. Stop packing. We're staying. We're staying? How'd you do that? I didn't do anything. We have a rule book. A rule book, sir? You know, a book with rules in it. What do you need a rule book for? Playing by the rules. Because I always play by the rules. How do you know you're playing by the rules if you need a rule book to tell you what the rules are? I need a rule book to tell me which rules I... Just get me the book.
You need anything else, sir? Chinese food? No dose? No, thank you, Sergeant. I'm fine. Well, then, night, sir. What sounds better? The Bradley has so far failed virtually every test, or the testing program of the Bradley has been without any coherent standards? They both sound like something the general wouldn't want in his report. This is not just a report. It's a deadly weapon. Sir, an M16 is a deadly weapon. A report is just a pile of paper, unless you plan to inflict a lot of extremely vicious paper cuts. Go home, Sergeant. Good night, sir. The failure of the Bradley to incorporate even the most elementary safeguards to protect the troops inside raises questions about the integrity. And the manner in which the vaporifics test was carried out suggests either negligence or a failure in the chain of command. Had any troops been inside the vehicle, as it is currently configured, they would have been killed either by toxic fumes, flames, or by the overpressure created by the powerful expanding gas in the compartment. And as a result of manifest deficiencies in every area, this office and as a result of manifest deficiencies is advising the area, immediate this necessity office is advising the immediate necessity of live fire, live fire testing, testing under combat, combat conditions. conditions. Rewrite it! Sir? Rewrite the fucking piece of garbage so it smells like a rose! The Bradley test standards have been consistently altered in extreme ways. The Bradley tests have been extremely consistent. They have altered the standards for testing. test has revealed design flaws in the Bradley. The marginalized optimal performance data suggests no vaporific shift. performance data suggests no vaporific shift at this time. <laughs> That's brilliant, Lieutenant. That's absolutely brilliant. <laughs> Thank you, sir. But, sir? What? What does it mean? What do you mean, what does it mean? You wrote it. <laughs> Good afternoon. The Bradley tests have been extremely consistent. They have altered the standards for testing. Have you actually read this thing? It's exactly the opposite of what you wrote. How can they do that? They're playing by the book, Sergeant. And so am I. Paper cuts. Vicious paper cuts. The characterization in your report is at best a serious misunderstanding of the testing procedures on a vehicle as flawed as the Bradley. As noted in my original report, the integrity... <laughs> Jesus Christ! Who did this fucking thing go to? The distribution page listed 198 names. Court Marshal, the son of a bitch! Lock him up now! Oh, we can't. We sure as hell can! Burton's playing by the book. His report was classified. It was sent to you. You revised it and sent it back to him. He wrote a memo on your revision, which, in accordance with regulations, can be sent to anyone remotely involved with the Bradley. In this case, 198 people. I will fucking kill him. I will fillet him. I will draw and quarter him. I'll stick his head in a vice. We can't touch him, sir. It's by the book. And you find me something in that goddamn book that'll help me fry the little son of a bitch. What? Sir, the Washington Post is on the phone. Well, that was fast. Leaks don't usually get to them till after lunch. 
Yes? No, he cannot comment on that right now. Thank you. No, we cannot make a comment now. No, he cannot comment on that. I'm sorry, but under military rules, I'm unable to comment. I, I can't comment. No. No, no comment. Sorry, bye. I'm getting locked jaw from not saying anything. Burton. I can't, I can't comment. Is there anything I can comment on? Well, yes. I just received orders that I am to report for duty in Alaska. Alaska is a prestige posting, Senator. <laughs> no, 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 I assure you that memo of his had absolutely nothing to do with his being transferred. <laughs> oh, Senator, I'm sorry, I've just been informed that Secretary Weinberger's on the other line. Yes, I'll get right back to you. I promise. Thank you. <laughs> uh, sir, before you pick up, Weinberger's on two. Uh, line one is the Times. Line three is the Wall Street Journal. Line four is Newsweek. Line five is the House Armed Services Committee. House Armed Services Committee? What do they want? Hearings, sir. On the Bradley. Alaska? What? I said Alaska, General. As I said in my opening remarks, Madam Chairman, a lot of things have to come together to create teamwork. Good old-fashioned teamwork. Yes, you told us, General. And Colonel Burton's not a team player. He's a rogue operator. I'm not a name caller, Madam Chairman, but if you wish to make that connection, that would be your choice, not mine. Did you ever say to Colonel Burton, if I get one more call from the Hill about your uh, expletive deleted reports, you'll be sitting on your brains? Does that sound like me, sir? Just answer the question, General, please. I don't remember saying it. Not that I wasn't provoked. Two witnesses testified that you said those exact words to Colonel Burton outside the Pentagon Pharmacy. I have visited the pharmacy quite a bit lately for antacids. <laughs> <laughs> but I would never say anything like that to anyone, let alone a fellow officer. But you make no secret of your antagonism towards Colonel Burton. Now, it's his report that I don't approve of. Colonel Burton's report is fallacious, misinformed, and accusatory. And I have no use for an officer who is more interested in grabbing headlines than he is in defending this country. The committee would like to call as witness Colonel James G. Burton, United States Air Force. Madam Chairman. Yes, General. As you must know, under the rules of military conduct, no man can appear at these hearings without the express order of his commanding officer. Unfortunately, General DeGrasso is on a fact-finding tour of our bases in Germany. I don't believe General DeGrasso has given any order for Colonel Burton to testify. You're quite right, General. But as Colonel Burton has been transferred to Alaska, he's no longer under General DeGrasso's command. Am I correct?
Do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do. <sighs> Looks like you've stirred up a hornet's nest, Colonel. It was never my intention, ma'am. What was your intention? Simply to do the job I was assigned to do. The Army test reports do not make the possibility of casualties a top priority. In fact, General Partridge's report on the Bradley doesn't even mention the word casualty. Not once. I came to the conclusion that what was required was a live fire test. I requested such a test repeatedly. Did you get that test? No, ma'am, I did not. Why not? I wanted more realism than Army testing was accustomed to providing. You want realism? General, you are out of order. Madam Chairman, in the interest of resolving some of the issues presented here today, I'd like to say something. Please be brief, General. Of course. Colonel Burton wants more realism. So let's talk about the real world for a moment. The real world has enemies in it. There are forces at work, even now as we speak, with one objective in mind, the destruction of this country. We must not. We will not allow those forces to prevail, for if we do, you can be certain that you and I and everyone else will never again enjoy the luxury of meeting in this building to debate anything. As I said at the outset, we are in the business of winning. That takes teamwork. General, the teamwork you so prize, I take it it was in full force during the development of the Bradley fighting vehicle? Textbook. Perhaps you'd like to tell us how much has been spent so far to develop the Bradley. How much? Well, you have the figures, don't you? Of course. Uh... Fourteen. More or less. Fourteen? Fourteen. Million? Uh, yeah. What did you say, General? Billion. Billion? With a B? With a B. Fourteen billion dollars for designing one armored vehicle. That's one way of looking at it. Of taxpayers' money. We are all taxpayers, after all. We're in this together. General, how many years has this program been running? Bear with me. Just a moment. Uh, uh, well, let me, uh, say 12, 15, 17. What? <laughs> 17. Which is evidence of the enormous care my team takes in the development of every weapons system undertaken by the Pentagon. Hmm. 17 years. 14 billion dollars. Of the taxpayers' money. General, I think it's time the American public gets the live fire test that Colonel Burton wants.
Tomorrow's the big day, sir. Uh-huh. I'll tell you one thing. Every damn one of these nuts and bolts has been taken off and put back on again. This wouldn't be flame retardant, would it? You think they made the men trick this whole thing up? Wouldn't surprise me. Not a bit. At ease, gentlemen. Looks like you've been working hard. Corporal? Sir? Let me have one of those M16s. I want to tell you a story. You got a problem with that, Sergeant? No, sir. About a year ago, I went to the veteran's hospital, visit a friend of mine for my flying days. Only I took a wrong turn when I got off the elevator. Now, when I look back on it, I think I was meant to go down that corridor. Because that's where I met Phil. Thank you, Corporal. But, sir, let me finish, Dalton. I want to pass on something I learned about the M16 from Phil. You all know the M16 better than I do. A lot of you used it in Vietnam. But you were lucky. In the early days of that war, they sent guys off to fight with M16s that jammed in combat. A little bit of dust, a little bit of rain, and the gun was useless. Maybe those early M16s weren't tested properly. Maybe somebody somewhere was more worried about a production schedule or a promotion than he was about those grunts in some faraway jungle who might end up with their stomachs in their hands. But you don't know anyone that happened to, do you? No. I'm sure not. Otherwise, you'd be out there right now making sure that that Bradley is exactly, and I mean exactly, the way it would be under normal combat conditions. With some of your buddies riding inside. Guys like Phil. Only Phil has been in a coma for the last 20 years, since the day his M16 jammed somewhere outside of Benoit. But hell. You don't know the guy. Or anybody like him. Right? Sir. Everything all right? Oh, fine, sir. Just fine. Keep coming. Keep coming. Keep coming. A little more. Keep coming. Keep coming. Whoa. Sergeant? Sir. Everything all right, Sergeant? Fine, sir. Thank you. Jeez, 
Looks like some party. Ladies and gentlemen, please be seated. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished members of Congress, I think it's fair to say that you'll be seeing enough from this test to give you the basis once and for all to form your own conclusion about the sort of systemic excellence we've been pursuing. I will be giving the signal shortly. When I do, I want you to visualize combat conditions. Imagine that the men firing that round are the enemy and that the Bradley, I don't have to tell you, the Bradley is on our side. Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished members of Congress, I give you your Bradley fighting vehicle. planned, isn't it? To go exactly as it should, sir. As planned, right? Corporal, this is Sergeant Dalton. Move the vehicle about five yards forward and then clear out. Over. Roger that. For your further edification, the Bradley can be fired accurately while... How much fuel is in those tanks, Sergeant? Just enough to do those maneuvers? No more than it would have if it was in combat, sir. Seven total, Miss Fired a launcher mounted on the left side. And the ammunition inside the Bradley? Up to spec, sir. Who specs? Maneuverable. And capable of keeping pace with main battle. Carrying infantry troops needed to support tank operations. More than briefed as to the test conditions. And the hour is at hand. All eyes front on the Bradley fighting vehicle. The vehicle that will carry our boys to victory for many, many years to come. Back blast area clear! Fire! tried to tell you, sir. You see, sir, when you gave us that speech last night, we had already fixed the vehicle back to the way it should be. So you were, uh, you were ahead of me. I don't know about ahead, but we've been behind you ever since you fried those mannequins. <laughs> <laughs> and the sheep, sir. <laughs> Man, that was epic. <laughs> Ha, ha, ha.
<laughs> I'm sorry I made you listen to that lecture now. I, uh... Sir. Well, you have nothing to apologize for, sir. We had you figured wrong. The men come first with you, and you prove that. It was a hell of a good speech, though, sir. Anytime you want to give another one, you know where to find us. Thank you, men. Thank you all. Sir! 